type one is kind of your aerobic fat burning mm -hmm. style muscle tissue. And then the type two is more of the carbohydrate loving or fast twitch muscle. As you increase in intensity, you get that transition away from type one and more type two. So what you see is, is a push towards carbohydrate metabolism and then eventually that just kind of takes over. You conducted the test is like we established a baseline, like jog, then a, a fast walk, then a jog. And then once we established our speed, I think it was like six miles an hour for me, we just started increasing the grade every minute, I believe. Right. So we, we started you out just as a, as a slow walk. And over the course of about five or six minutes, I slowly got you up to your testing speed, which would be your testing speed. And in, in your case, it was six miles per hour on the treadmill. And then after that, every minute, I increase the treadmill grade by 1%. And so what we're doing is we're increasing the workload gradually, and we're, we're essentially maxing out your, your um, oxygen. Use capacity. Uh, yeah, oxygen use capacity and, and forcing you to transition between different energy systems in the, in the muscle um, to the point where – you're basically transitioning away from burning fat, which is uh, the substrate that's typically used at low intensities. Mm -hmm. And you start, and I artificially force you to transition to using more carbohydrates later in the in the protocol um, until the point where you tap out. And so for you, I think you, we got you up to what ten percent grade. It was uh, pretty. I think we were like at twelve. 12% grade. Yeah, we went up there, man. Man, okay, I'll have to remember that. I'll have to go back and look. Well, let's see. Uh, yeah, so that's probably true. Because I've got... That's pretty steep. Actually, 12% yeah, is quite, quite a quite on Moving on up there. And th this is why a lot of people train like heart rate style training. Like they'll mm -hmm. try and pick a zone and stay in that zone depending on what their goals are, which is something I've never done previously. Like I've never... I don't do a ton of cardio, but like when I'm in a fat loss phase, like I, I've never paid two minds to what my heart rate is or train based off of a zone heart rate calculation. Right. Think of heart rate as an indicator of workload, mm -hmm. you know, so it's directly proportional to your workload, you know, so the higher your heart rate, the more work you're doing, the more taxing it is on your body, if you will. So what was interesting in your case is because of your ketogenic diet, I was interested to see to yeah, let's, let's pull to, that to, up. Um, so let me, if you'll like pull your screen down. Yeah, let me pull it out. And then. Yeah, there you go. I don't know why mine's not maximized though. <clears throat> see, there we go. And you can see that on your end, Chip. I can actually plug that into the thing. Okay, so we're, you're getting the full picture there. Mm -hmm. um, so before we dive into mine, which is mine right here, let's look at a typical scan mm -hmm. and you sent me a few this is just the first one right but even the Th other ones you sent a, this uh, is textbook this yeah. is pretty much textbook and this yeah. this individual was looks like 51 years old mm -hmm. male but you sent me some that were closer in age to me and it's pretty similar layout exactly mm -hmm. they uh, all, so they all kind of look the same yep walk us through what we're seeing here yep. so what we see here is an effective fat burn chart where each column is one minute of the protocol and that black area is the caloric contribution of fat. Um, and the brown or the tan is the caloric contribution of carbohydrates or sugar. And so what we see is over the course of this protocol, as the workload goes up, your fat burning um, machinery in the cell, you know, in the mitochondria is is being able to keep up with a lot of the workload. You still have a little bit of sugar burn underneath that, which is, which is, you see that a lot. But notice as the workload starts to go up, your body starts to rely less and less on fat and mm -hmm. more and more on carbohydrate. You know, it does that for a lot of different reasons. Um, we know that you can get energy from carbohydrate much more faster and more efficiently over a short period of time than you can fat. And so your body generally wants to transition to that. You know, the other thing too, to look at, at this is you have increases in adrenaline, right? As something gets harder and more stressful, mm -hmm. you get more adrenaline uh, into the bloodstream. And that actually 
um, can cause the breakdown of sugar more quickly in the liver. And so you get a little more sugar out there available to you. It also, um, you have what's known as muscle type transition, muscle fiber type transition. Like type one, type two. Type, type one is type one is kind of your aerobic fat burning mm -hmm. style muscle tissue. And then the type two is more of the carbohydrate loving or fast twitch muscle. And so as the core, as you increase in intensity, you get that transition away from type one and more type two. So what you see is, is a push towards carbohydrate metabolism. And then eventually that just kind of takes over Yeah. Um, because your body just says, you know what? I just can't do the fat anymore. We're just going to do carbohydrate because that's how we're, that's, that's the road you want to go down. We're going to use carbohydrates going out. So every well, when you're at peak capacity, I mean, your, your liver and your muscles are dumping all stored glycogen and that's just what's getting used. Yeah. That's whatever's in the muscle. You know, you certainly already have stuff in the muscle and then what's in the bloodstream and then what gets kicked out through the, in the, from the liver. But all roads lead to a very tall brown column. That's yeah. I get everybody there, and and it's just interesting to see that that's where it goes. But in your in your guys's case, yeah, pull over to mine. Here. I was it was very fascinating. So this is what being keto for a decade plus results in. I actually didn't expect it to look like that. Uh, I was fascinated to see that from your heart rate from eighty five beats per minute to really, I mean, close to 120 beats per minute, you were almost using zero yeah. sugar. I was, I couldn't believe that. And honestly, like it didn't start, um, carbohydrate didn't exceed fat until I was pretty much like 161, 167. Right. Uh, as a heart rate. So up Which until is a high heart point, rate. That's yeah, a high heart I mean, rate. That's like, yeah. I'd go on trail runs and that's a pretty good yeah. clip on a trail run. So like it didn't, I mean, when I'm typically just trained, unless I'm all out sprinting, I mean, I'm predominantly fat metabolism, which is pretty cool. Yeah, uh, definitely that's the case here. I mean, the predominance of fat in this profile is profound. Um, it's interesting, you know, your cro the crossover point for you is like what you said, the crossover point being the point where the caloric contribution of fat and carbohydrates is about the same. Mm-hmm. It was in the 160, 161 is kind of where the average heart rate was at that at that point. But what's interesting about fat metabolism versus carbohydrate metabolism, we know that lactate, mm -hmm. that comes from carbohydrate metabolism, not yeah. fat metabolism. So, you know, when you're burning a lot of sugar very quickly, you can accumulate the lactate. And that's where things start to unravel. And this is literally why I never get sore. Like I train every single day. I never get sore, especially with like weight training. I'm, I'm typically not going super high on my heart rate, mm -hmm. but I'm never having this lactate threshold being met. So I don't ever get that lactate burn, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. But uh, it's, in, yeah, I was, it's very fascinating to see the predominance of, of fat metabolism during the course of this protocol. I mean, Two, I don't know, two thirds, almost three quarters of your protocol was fat. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen that. <laughs> I would love to have gotten this test like the first year I started doing keto and see how it compares to now having done it for over a decade. Because I was, I would assume that the deeper levels of adaptation I'm in, that fat predominant metabolism source of energy is mm -hmm. just elongated. Um, but I'll have to do this again uh, to see. But what? When I think of this from an efficacious standpoint for athletes, like if you're if you're deeply fat adapted, then you're able to tap into a much larger fuel reserve because you've got much more stored fat than you can store in glucose in your liver and muscles. Um, so if you're not having to rely on what is stored in glucose for much longer than your peer group or competitors, then you've got a much longer, larger lasting reserve of fuel. Um, so like this, I think is very efficacious for endurance athletes as well. Because most like endurance sports, like unless you're going all out sprinting, like you can be like in my case, I mean, I can be jogging at 150 heart rate for a long time. And that whole time I'm predominantly using fat, you know? Mm -hmm. So so if you look at the difference between the energy currency that one molecule of glucose provides you versus one molecule of, let's say, palmitic acid fat, mm -hmm. you know? Palmitic acid fat can give you two and a half times as much ATP energy just mm -hmm. in one molecule. 
So like you said, that, that reserve, there's so much more energy packed into a fat molecule that you can, that we can grab onto. If you have the machinery to do it, it's there. If you have the, if you have the factories, it. if you have enough factories online uh, to get yourself into that fat molecule and, and do it efficiently, you haven't, it's almost unlimited in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you, if you have the machinery to do it. Yeah. So that's kind of what we see here is I actually, you, it was a good test. And that was, I was impressed. Yeah, Even Greg was, was impressed. <laughs> yeah, it was cool, man. And Greg's profile looked very similar yeah. to mine. I mean, yeah. we both had that elongated fat metabolism. He had a different, I think he had a different protocol. And I can't remember if you guys did the exact same protocol. I think his was like f fast walking and then a slight jog. And mine was a, little, a slow jog to more of a faster jog or something But what was like interesting that. is the the essence of your profile were very yeah. similar. That was, yeah. we definitely garnished that from the analysis is that, um, your ketogenic diet is is producing a, a particular type of profile, at least between you two guys. Yeah. You know, if we were to analyze 25 of you, you know, I've had a conga line of VO2 max test for ketogenic athletes. I Because I don't have a lot of, you two were the only ones I've tested that were ketogenic. So I don't have a lot of experience with that. That's why it was fascinating to see how different the profile was compared to even runners. Yeah. Even runners. Because a runner, I mean, I don't know what this individual's activity levels are like, but I mean, this is textbook, you say, right? Like this is uh, pretty yeah, much you, what... You, yeah, you, you see the the rising fat and then it just really tapers off fairly quickly, usually mm -hmm. in, you know, anywhere from a heart rate to 145 to 150 in a lot of people, you know, based on conditioning level. But moving forward after that, there's no fat, yeah. almost none. But you guys carried it out much further, and it was much more robust along the way. So those columns are much higher in their caloric contribution across the most of the protocol, which is fascinating. Yeah, no, super interesting, man. Thank you for watching this episode of The Savage Clip. If you want to see the full-blown deep dive, check out the full episode here, and I'll see you there.